everybody, and welcome to the video words. So today we're going to have a new episode. And uh, first, this is Zoe from Vinular, and then for this episode, I have Thomas, who joined me uh, from London. So he will be the co-host for this episode. And for this episode, so every episode is special, but for this one, I would say it's really special that we invite Benjamin and Adam join us today. I think mostly we're going to talk about some video compression and codec stuff. I will let Benjamin and Adam to introduce themselves. And as far as I know, they are joining this episode from Berlin. So this time, I really appreciate this opportunity with the four of us together. We're going to have some good stuff to talk about. And uh, so now, like Benjamin and yeah. Adam, like, hey. <laughs> thanks to, for the invite. We are very honored. Uh, my name is uh, Benjamin. Uh, next to me is Adam, and uh, we are heading the video coding systems uh, uh, group in Fraunhofer HHI, and we focus on implementing video coding standards where uh, Fraunhofer is also contributing. That's where I started in HEBC times, uh, where I first met Thomas uh, also, uh, when he was back at BBC, and we uh, uh, working on HEBC, and then uh, Adam came in right before VVC. Yeah, I, I came like six years back and we were just getting started with uh, VVC at HHI and I've been working for a few years trying to develop technology for VVC, for the standard itself. And since a few years, uh, I've been mostly doing the implementation projects on VVC. So it's funny, for, for, for HEVC, you always look for uh, in standardization for a software basis. And for uh, HEVC, uh, this was uh, from, uh, I guess, uh, Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong, from Samsung BBC was the, the starting base. Uh, and from uh, VVC, it was the uh, software base that actually Adam uh, uh, was working on that we proposed. Oh, so cool. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just want to actually mention, it's very interesting because you two just mentioned HEVC and VVC. And now, of course, it's another name for this two standard, right? So H.265 and H.266. Like, at least a lot of people say that's a nickname. So, so I have to learn when or why. I know this have two names because of the two codec uh, organization behind the scene. But um, talk a little bit more about it. So HEVC, I think, for me, I only knew that it was finalized in 2013 because that was also the year VP9 was finalized. And then so VVC was finalized in 2020. So I knew that because that was two years after AV1 was finalized, and then people started to, oh, now VVC came out and there's some advantage down in their line. So you can do more um, because you have, uh, including Thomas, right, heavily involved uh, the development, I would say, the inventor to come, like, finally push this standard to come into being. Yeah. yeah, so so perhaps you could talk a bit about what VVC adds on top of HEVC and how they're related. They seem to have quite a similar basic core, but there's lots of things that have been added in the VVC. Yeah, yeah maybe to get everyone uh, watching and listening on board, the, the, the core of all, be it uh, HEVC, VP9, uh, VVC, everyone is a hybrid video codec. Um, mm -hmm. prediction and transform coding uh, of the prediction residual and so but from standard to standard uh, where we are on from HEVC to VVC this got more and more generalized and uh, of course complicated um, and so a lot of coding tools uh, have been modified or extended as well as new coding tools in prediction and transform in entropy coding uh, come. But it's it's more an evolution than, than a revolution. So the, the basic concept of all these uh, codecs is, is still the same since uh, H.261 uh, MPEG-1 uh, and okay. it's still evolved. Uh, got more and more modes for encoders, more decisions to make, uh, uh, sometimes hard decisions. Um, and yeah, for VVC, uh, the, the most recent one, uh, which we both have been involved, that's 
uh, focus on versatility. So it's versatile video coding, and uh, uh, the focus there was mainly to have a broad support for a wide range of applications, not just the usual coding efficiency, so uh, saving bits, uh, for example, 50% for the same perceived quality, but also to have specific coding tools well suited to efficiently code HDR, 8K video, so really high fidelity video, uh, 360 degree video for VR, AR applications. We have uh, good low latency streaming uh, support with a, a modified high level syntax for the system layer uh, in order to, to facilitate low latency transport. We uh, worked on reference picture resampling, which is a feature that enables resolution switching within uh, a bitstream. We can talk about that later because it's a specific use case uh, 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 with open GOP streaming, uh, multi-resolution adaptive streaming with uh, open GOP. Uh, that's, that's very exciting because this is something that people always believe does, cannot happen, but uh, BBC enables that. Um, yeah, so, and the other uh, uh, point that is attached to that is that you have mostly, most of this covered by a single profile. There's a main 10 profile. Uh, typically, you have different profiles for different applications. So then uh, not every decoder needs to implement the whole standard, but just a specific uh, profile. For ITVC, there's been a, a a main profile, a main 10 for 10 bit, main profile only is 8 bit. Then there was a, a later came screen content coding extensions. Um, I know you guys do a lot of uh, like gaming and this kind of uh, uh, computer generated content. There was an, an extension to HEBC, so a separate profile. But at that time, HEBC was deployed uh, with the main 10 profile. So uh, the, the decoders in the field could not make use of this nice advanced feature of screen content coding. And for uh, uh, VVC, everything uh, that I mentioned, 8K, screen content coding, uh, efficient streaming, low latency, is all baked in the main, print, the main 10 profile. Uh, the only additional profile is scalability. So scalability has always been, well, it's been there. Yeah, it has been always been there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So people yeah, are still so convinced, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I remember some interesting discussions back in the HEVC days because about scalability, um, these always get quite intense. So I, I'm very glad to see reference picture resampling in VVC. It was something that I tried to get into HEVC and um, because it's captured partly by the scalability profiles, I think there was a reluctance to do that, but I... I think now there's a recognition that video codecs have to do multiple applications. Um, it was a problem with HEVC. It was something that AV1 actually really tried to address and have a simplified profile. But it's really hard for hardware guys. They they don't like having to support so many tools and so many uh, so many kinds of things under one profile. So was it kind of difficult to to get all these things and the profile discussions, you know, with the software guys and the hardware guys all on board. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's a very good point because that, so now we are uh, a bit late uh, in, uh, in Berlin, like one hour ahead of London, several hours ahead of uh, Pacific time. But we are used to that because we had these uh, standardization meetings <laughs> going way beyond that hour. Uh, yeah, this yeah. Is exactly that, that kind of discussion. But, uh, it's tedious if you if you develop and and always have to convince people and discuss and make uh, compromises. But at the end, I think it's a very good uh, thing and uh, um, a very uh, strong advantage of this process because you have people that needs to implement it that that has they they have a focus on complexity and that the chip doesn't get too expensive. Uh, and it's affordable uh, that you don't have to have uh, to pay uh, uh, a lot of money to uh, to build the chip. So this, and then 
from we coming mostly from academia, having these nice ideas of how to compress, which is like super complicated, and this, uh, um, yeah, this clashes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> discussions. And at the end, uh, they say, well, this is the most critical thing. We work on that. And one good example is uh, for BBC, we introduced a neural network based intra prediction. So we tried to, from this hybrid uh, classic coding approach, we tried to do the intra prediction uh, by a neural network. Uh, and that worked great. Uh, it saved like 4%. Um, maybe people not that familiar with uh, uh, current codex, 4% is quite a lot nowadays. Uh, yes, 4% yeah. is a lot. Yeah, this yeah. is a lot. Uh, it, 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 to small, it, 25 to 30%, that's like a generational difference. And that 4% as opposed to 30% is definitely uh, like more than 10% out of that game, right? So this is uh, very important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but this neural network on a block basis, this was like a, a really a no-go for, for implementers. So they gave us really a hard time. And at the end, we tried to cut it down, remove the non-linearities from the... And at the end, we ended up uh, having like a matrix multiplication of several like pre-trained learned matrices depending on the neighboring samples as an, uh, as an input to the multiplication. So this is how we then transformed the neural network based uh, uh, coding tool into a more or less simple matrix multiplication with offset uh, for intra prediction, which is trained, so still data driven, but you don't need a, a neural network to implement. And, and, and this is a very good example of, of how that works. But then we, of course, we ended up with 1%. So uh, it just can <laughs> force up your whole gain, but it still you could implement it way easy, uh, uh, way more easily than uh, than, than a new network, of course. And I mean, right. on, on the other hand, the standard is called Versipile, and it was, you know, the name was agreed pretty early. So, you know, coming back to the initial question, uh, it was an issue, you know, squeezing all of those things into like single profile or a few profiles, mm -hmm. but it was uh, a prerequisite of the development to have something that is, you know, good for all the problems that are out there, more or less. Right, you basically just say, hey, we have all these applications that this standard one will address, right? Just now you mentioned there's a low delay and there's a different content, including gaming, this type of screen content. You also mentioned 360 and you put all these kind of different, I would say new use cases for video into this one single profile. And to actually, this would be good for, let's say the hardware implementation because you put a one profile they said they are going to support they claim they support this profile then they have to support every single thing within their profile right and this is make uh, also uh, instead of like HEVC, um, there's an extension screen content profile that not be able to support it by many HEVC players for example that's actually considering at least a certain usages for that standard and we can see that the VBC definitely at least from my perspective, is that they take that lesson to actually put uh, VBC in a better spot. And just uh, you also mentioned that it's a great point. You mentioned the AI part is actually at least, uh, I think, uh, guide us to go to one direction, showing, oh, there's a great potential for present. Then you really want to get a simplified, otherwise the hardware guys will have, we will have to say, they are not so happy with and then we rely on them. I think at least standard, right? When the hardware start to support the standard, is actually how build up the ecosystem uh, for this standard. But then at least you got one percent. Um, so talk a little bit more. What is the neural network? Why the hardware do not like that? And um, why? But then at least I mentioned that that's at least the giveaway, saying that okay. There's a potential, it guides us to optimize along that way, finally get that 1%. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not a, uh, Adam, uh, feel free to chime in, but I'm, I'm not a hardware expert. I can only parrot what, uh, uh, what, what uh, we have been told during the development. And uh, yeah, so mainly it's, uh, I think a neural network is great if you have uh, like a huge amount of data, like a picture. You get it wow. in the network and you get it out. So like pre-analysis, that's a very good example. Uh, uh, look ahead, pre all these tasks are related to, to, to what is around the codec. Uh, is, is, 
I, I see as a very good task for, for, for a neural network. But once you're at a block level, you have these, uh, this, uh, this... It's very branchy. Yeah. The quad tree, you have these, these ternary branches, binary branches. And then on these blocks, you have then uh, to execute networks on, on, on these different shapes and sizes and have them on a die uh, with all the coefficients of that network that are trained, which consume a lot of memory. And exactly the, like, this is what we've been told, that memory is uh, supposed to be super expensive. So it's a, <laughs> um, it's, it's a combination of, of both, of memory and then... Uh, I mean, one more thing is uh, the mode that we're talking about is an intra mode, right? So you need the neighboring... Yeah already reconstructed to, you know, run your neural network, like run your inference. Uh, so this creates a big latency, right? If you input an image, get out an image, you can allow yourself like a few milliseconds of latency. But this is, if this is really block for block in a serial manner, uh, you have like a few milliseconds of latency to execute your neural network, this is yeah. uh, too much, you know? And every time you have to fetch all of those coefficients uh, and stuff, it, it, it really gets too much. It was actually uh, funny seeing this develop where, you know, the colleagues were bringing in this tool, like simplified every meeting and basically every meeting there was some new requirement. Like first of, first it was the neural network and uh, they did a matrix multiplication and, and it was, all right guys, uh, you can, uh, we can uh, put it into VVC if you reduce the memory to this and then to this and then to this. But yeah, we did that and in, in yeah. the end uh, it works. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to ask you a bit about your software implementation um, experience. Um, so you develop your own implementation of um, VVC and um, HEVC before that. But for standardization, do you think that really helped you understand the complexity arguments, the fact that you'd actually had to implement an encoder, maybe not a decoder, but um, but, but an encoder at least? Yep, I, I can tell a little bit about HEVC and then uh, Aaron has, has a lot to say about VVC. <laughs> For HEVC, I just remember that uh, during standardization there was this residual quadri that splits the prediction residual uh, in a quadri uh, for for transform, and we really had a hard time getting the complexity down uh, in uh, on, on the reference software uh, in order to to justify the gain. And, and there was a lot of discussion around that: is it justified to have this tree? And the encoder, in the live encoder, uh, at that time we we did an HEBC broadcast live encoder, and for that it turned out to be super helpful because it's cheaper and way faster to split it in, in, in that domain uh, and to restrict the uh, the prediction blocks uh, on the size so actually for in, a, in an encoder in, in an actual encoder uh, we by implementing it for for a live scenario we uh, learned that that's beneficial and we would would have wished to know that when we are still discussing and debating that in standardization so that's in that time, in retrospective, it, it, it helps, and maybe in the future, and for VVC, what, what's the... I mean, I, I came to, to product development, like, from a different field, you know, so I started with HABC, with the HM software, and for me, back then, it was, like, the fast software compared to, to the state of VVC was in back then, so, you know, Ben is talking about how HABC, like, how stuff used to be too complex, and for me, it was, like, the easy uh, encoder. So, of course, you know, you get into VBC and it, it used to be bad. Like, you used to, uh, you know, have to wait days for your experiments uh, to finish. And uh, the stuff I was initially working on was the, was the partition. And partitioning in VBC with all the new kinds of split is actually, like, one of the most bothersome parts for the, for the encoder. So, you know, in the end, uh, when we were talking about the, the partitioning proposals, the discussion were kind of going in the direction who has the best way of uh, controlling their partitioning algorithm. Uh, so, so, you know, the arguments that were being brought in the standardization, they were not about like the uh, uh, advantages of your partitions, but rather how fast can you go through your, through your partitions, which of course, you know, if, if you sit down for one or two months more, you're going to come up with an even better way. Uh, so, so this was interesting to see. I think this was also like a new aspect uh, in VVC that, uh, you know, implementation complexity was uh, was being looked on. 
But yeah. you, you, you can see, at, at least if in partitioning, if you consider the theoretically all possible combinations of splits, mm -hmm. you will not be able to compute that. So even for, for a reference software and reference implementation, you need to have like a fast search uh, for yeah. that and, and ideally even shortcuts in there. Uh, so this, uh, and um, yeah, but then uh, uh, that's also a good uh, uh, example uh, for ex if we want to talk about uh, AI in, in coding, uh, where we uh, tried a lot, uh, because there's also in, in literature you find a lot of approaches that try to, um, uh, to uh, reduce the search space of the partitioning. Um, and uh, Adam also investigated that quite a lot with uh, and he's, <laughs> since then he's not at least in, in, in that codec control domain not a big fan uh, of, of uh, uh, yeah AI. so uh, like because you already mentioned uh, like the AI codec but from the standard point of view just we mentioned right so you mentioned that this uh, new, uh, there's a neural network based approach at least the manifest a potential 4% gain and finally laid down to 1% with a lot less complexity, a lot more friendly to the hardware implementation. And then on top of it, uh, the standard, we talk about encoder optimization. So because there's so many modes, there's already a lot. Actually back to 2C4, I still remember that when I was, <laughs> I was there to attending the first uh, conference when I joined the Nokia. So my manager told me, okay, you have really told them that H.264, even it's very complicated, but then there's a potential down there. But now nobody thinks 264 is complicated. So now we have a VBC and 26 already. Now we talk about uh, the optimization of the encoder, as just Benjamin mentioned, because there's so many tools that have been developed then how do we optimize it? And then we know this is some papers addressing that you can, when you talk about reduce the complexity, meaning that you have to make a decision for different cases and you now probably guide you to that decision. Then I, I just, yeah, follow what just about mentioned, uh, Adam has may have some uh, thoughts uh, or different opinions regarding deploying new network for this kind of encoder optimization, reduce the complexity. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, uh, just to step back a bit, uh, you know, you, you talk how people used to think H.264 is complicated. For H.265, the reference software in the partitioning, it actually still does the full search. So there is no uh, like early termination in there, you know. Uh, so this also shows how much more complex VBC is because, you know, everyone knows that the reference software of VBC is like, uh, let's say, eight times slower than the reference software of, of uh, HEBC, even though there already are a multitude of like early, early termination modes uh, in the search algorithm, especially for, uh, for partitioning. And now, you know, people uh, sometimes say, well, you know, we're going to standardize this and then the implementers are going to take care of it and how they're just going to implement neural networks because, you know, they can deal with everything. But I, I've been following uh, research, I've been following uh, papers, and like what I see is that it's actually a very, very tough problem. So the, there isn't yet a really good solution to like drive VBC partitioning using uh, neural in inference mm -hmm. uh, and still produce like the like very good results, you know, at, at a lower speed. An interesting comparison that I did, uh, just as with uh, HBC, I guess, uh, you know, you know you, on an encoder, you have the options to try different uh, partitioning depths, different block sizes, but you don't have to, right? Your encoder can just say, I'm just going to do this one block size and not yeah. try anything else. So reducing VVC search space in that manner is, you know, actually gives you a lot of uh, different working points and creates like a convex hull of, of different uh, working points, at least with regards to partitioning. Uh, and I'm just running a comparison with uh, state of the art, with uh, results from the literature, and not 
not many of the literature uh, results can beat this convex hole, and if it's only by like a tiny margin, you know. So this shows you the, the complexity of the problem. Mm. But you know, yeah. this is also because the VT, VTM, the VBC reference software, it's already heavily optimized with regards to the partitioning algorithm. So you're basically trying to optimize an already optimized search space, right? So that's yeah. it's like complex. But so isn't there also kind of a chicken and egg problem with, with neural network optimization, which is <coughs> you need to generate a ground truth of the actually optimum partitions, yeah. but that's enormously complex and you can't generate enough data to, to correctly train your neural network. So you have a huge kind of bootstrapping problem that you need to make it a bit faster, then optimize again, then a bit faster and a bit faster. And maybe that will take a long time for for people to to get to a good neural network solution because you can't get the data until you're already fast. Yeah, true. But that's, I think that's that's a very good point because probably these networks have been trained in an already reduced optimized search space. Uh, it, it would have been uh, so they they are losing maybe a lot of options that are already. Uh, Excluded. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point too. And also, it's mm -hmm. like very hard, you know, to uh, model the temporal dependencies. Like for all intra coding, mm -hmm. this there are actually solutions that are very good, you know. But if you go into motion compensated coding, this uh, really becomes a very tough problem. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, we think at least a neural network that see that provide another angle to optimize first with a standard and then optimize the encoder. I think this, uh, as was mentioned down here, it could be a taken out because the new network first is the structure design and then a very important part of the whole approach is you have to collect enough training data and to light uh, the new state of the new network stay in the good status in order to have the result. But then besides that, uh, just now you mentioned not only your team are working on the codex standard, they start to work on more on the input optimization, provide something I believe is going to be open source. And open source community will always value that. Even us, we provide a commercial uh, solution, but we always say that we actually stand on top of the shoulders of giants and yeah. for the climb up. So we'd like to hear a little bit more about your encoder effort, optimization-wise, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's good to start with the motivation why we did that. Because in LTC, <laughs> we, we, we had that some kind of a, a core library that we licensed for, for broadcast appliances. Uh, ah. And now, uh, now we have a, uh, an offline encoder and a, and a software decoder that's, uh, that's open source on, on, on GitHub. So uh, why uh, we did that? Um, so, since we developed, uh, participated uh, as a main contributor in the development as a standard, we are, uh, uh, yeah, our main goal is to foster the uh, deployment of a standard. And uh, yes. which. Sorry, I don't want to disturb it, but no. I don't just mention the, the, the reference software is eight times slower than the VVC, the VTM, right? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, and 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 HEVC reference software was already super slow. <laughs> so yeah. it's eight times super slow, uh, and yeah. So we we but it's it it provides a very good coding efficiency. So um, that's yes. Apart from uh, encoder, nice yeah. Apart from encoder agnostic stuff like some uh, uh, adaptive quantization and this what you can apply to every codec, um, uh, it's uh, that you can add on top. So we want to keep that. So we want we do not want to sacrifice on the high coding efficiency of the reference software, but at the same time, wants to uh, have run times for the encoder that are usable. Let's say um, a couple of frames per second. It's not live, but uh, you can you can encode a, a catalog of uh, videos in a, in, a, in a decent amount of time. So and. Uh, also, if there, there are a lot of comparisons out there. A lot of people want to compare codecs and standards, and then there's a lot of confusion when they compare codecs, and actually they say the standard is it. So, and uh, we observed that in HEVC. So uh, people uh, took the 
open source, uh, for example, X265, uh, widely used, uh, uh, but um, it's not providing the full potential of HEBC that you would get, for example, by a commercial encoder. Um, so, and, and, but in every comparison, uh, these openly available encoder are used. Of course, they are available. People can have them at hand. They can use them. Uh, and uh, so we thought that is a bit misrepresenting the potential of the standard because in these comparisons, so HEVC, X265, they are used like interchangeable. And this is, uh, it's, it's always hard to teach people the difference between a standard, which is just defining the syntax, and an encoder implementation, which can be super efficient or super bad. It depends on, uh, or in the middle, or it can be fast, but not that efficient. So it's, the, the encoder is really application specific. And that's why we wanted for VVC, coming back to the original motivation, to have mm -hmm. something that is open available for everyone, but providing the best efficiency or keeping the, the high efficiency and then providing some, some uh, trade-off points. When you want to go faster encoding, you can sacrifice a bit, but you're never uh, less efficient than the HEVC reference software. So you're always better than the HEVC reference software. This was our motivation to and uh, so far, uh, we, are, we are happy that in, in all comparisons uh, that uh, people tested, we are always uh, the best performing open source coding. By different margins, depending on the conditions, depending on the contents, of course, but at least we are always uh, uh, best ranked. So this, this was the goal. Right. You made that very clear. So here is the HEVC, and then there is a VVC, right? And then the HEVC software, as you mentioned, if you really want to see the largest possible coding efficiency, then you run the reference software, but it's really slow. As you write many times, actually X265 has been regarded as a representative um, of the potential of HEVC. But we have to respect that because X265 as open source software is actually help build the ecosystem. When people want to learn at least the potential of HEVC compared to other, like uh, for example, ABC or some other standard, they actually did show there's a potential down there with a new standard, but not the full potential. Yeah. So then you move to VVC and said, okay, now we have a new standard, the potential even larger, but then how will people will see it? If it's even slower, a lot of people will just say, okay, no, it's very slow. Then how are we going to do that? So basically we understand you want to have an even faster open source encoder to manifest the potential, but it always at least as good as uh, is the processor, the ATVC. So at least you show there's a potential. And even larger if you can tolerate the more so, uh, speed wise. So the way to look at it, you know, uh, it's how much efficiency can you get for a given runtime, you know, for a given resource utilization. And this is what we're trying to keep like uh, against any other open source encoder if you have the same runtime with the same resources we want to have better efficiency you know that, uh, oh, that's how we see so we want to you know we want our fastest modes to be uh, at least as fast and maybe even faster than uh, some of the x265 modes we want to have comparable working points to other um, encoders but always keep the efficiency better and also for X265, if you go to the faster modes, you also give up some efficiency, right? That's how you have, right, the, yes. uh, have the, the curve. Uh, and, you know, at the, for a given runtime, we really can keep the, the efficiency improvement of, you know, 40, 50 percent. So, so that's, uh, you know, very... I'm very proud of this uh, result. Very proud. So basically, we talk about like uh, speed up, like video quality. Then here is coding efficiency about the bit rate or file size, and then here is the encoding time, or encoding speed, right? Okay. So we say, hey, let's fix this knob. It's all running at a similar encoding speed, and then let's say about the quality and bit rate. This is all together, uh, contribute to coding efficiency performance. Is that okay? When we fix this knob. And then you are encoder manifesting VBC always show at least a better one compared to the other baselines. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, what Thomas said. Yeah. So I was say you're you're trying to show also the actual gain from the syntax itself. You know, if you constrain the complexity, if you think of say VBC as 
being a kind of superset of HEVC, you should always be able to do better than HEVC for the same footprint because at the very worst you could just do an HEVC like implementation inside it but you've got lots of other options so you should be able to do better either faster or better quality or both but that's a, that's a very interesting point because you know we have our presets that we have and our fastest preset you know it's still like it still doesn't allow like live applications but just because of mm. uh, what you mentioned uh, we decided for now not to pursue faster presets because then you're going to go into this territory where you basically only have the modes that you will also have with HABC. So, you know, why go there? Then uh, maybe... Um, yeah. But it, it's also part of the uh, software structure that limits the, uh, true, though, the, yeah. the, the the speed because it's still derived from the reference software. Uh, but um, but uh, I wanted to say this is the encoder, but you mentioned the... Oh, uh, the put <laughs> very related to that... Uh, uh, it's uh, maybe it's good to separate two kind of encoder tools. One are the uh, the ones that are that require a search, and mm -hmm. uh, so you you do a, a search and then you uh, you signal the result, uh, or you do you, you you apply a certain tool always uh, to um, uh, increase the fidelity or to. Uh, or to do a search that you do not signal, but you do the same search at the decoder. We have some mm. small uh, decoder searches in, in yeah. VVC. Because if there, is, if there is no signaling, there is no choice to make, right? Mm. So the encoder yeah. and the decoder are both do the same. So th this is maybe very interesting if uh, people are not that yeah. familiar with uh, encoders. So you have things that an encoder can search, and then once it finds the optimum, it signals it, or it's just... Uh, does it without signaling, but the decoder needs to perform the same. Yeah. And this actually has an impact on, uh, on power consumption and right. runtime. So you can shift uh, a lot of these uh, encoder uh, uh, searches um, to the decoder searches, but then the decoder takes longer and consumes more power, okay. frankly, yeah. so simplifiedly okay. speaking. Um, uh, but and there are some really, is... yeah, yeah, and there's some really big issues about that now because I think, for example, the EU is wanting to constrain the amount of power that televisions can use, um, and having all these hungry decoder chips is a big problem. You know, so you really care about the complexity of the decoder and the complexity of the of tools that an encoder can't avoid. These are like the most important things to optimize because you can always do a reduced search at an encoder through some clever ideas but if you can't avoid these th this complexity it's um it hits the whole standard and the whole um ecosystem so here's the interesting thing about vbc so you know this algorithmic uh, complexity you can see it in like the decoder uh, complexity increase which is uh, around like two times more complex than the HEVC, which is actually, you know, very well kept in bounds, right? For the double the compression efficiency. Uh, and we found like two sides of it. So we found for the encoder that it, it's actually more efficient to take this additional, uh, you know, algorithmic complexity and then reduce the search space. So basically use the, those implicit modes instead of uh, trying to search through, uh, through like modes that you have to signal. So this is good for the encoder, but of course, you know, the decoder also has to do the work. Uh, so what we also did, we tried to find an uh, encoder setting that would decrease the uh, algorithmic complexity. So the runtime, so the power cons consumption on the decoder side, which is funny because, you know, this, we can keep most of the compression performance, but of course the, uh, there has to be a trade-off. And the trade-off is that the encoder needs a little bit more time to, to uh, calculate this uh, compression so you know you can you can really shift the complexity yeah. so co consider the scenario you uh, encode uh, a title for video on demand uh, and it takes twice as long with that special low decoder energy mode uh, you do that once but then it's watched and played and streamed to like 
depending on the popularity of that title, to a lot of devices that consume half the power. So this is, this is the kind of trade-off you have to keep in mind also when doing encoding and, and designing your, uh, your, your, your encoder uh, framework in your, in your application. To Maybe it's sometimes a good idea to spend more uh, effort and more complexity on the encoder side in order to save some at the, at the decoder end. Right. So you basically mentioned that when we um, do the when you do the encoder optimization, you also take into account the decoder side, the complexity, and the VVC has to such kind of uh, at least uh, quite certain choices that encoder can make, right? And I also mentioned based on the user cases, if the value use cases, and the encoder just once, and then there's a lot of decoder opportunities because people watch one movies for millions of times and that movie need only be encoded a very few times. But then also there's some other use cases like live, for example, and then you keep encoding and the other end to keep decoding. And then in that sense, then the overall, like we all mentioned, the energy, the power cost, whether we should go green, then we need to also another use case is a guide how we optimize the encoder. Mm. But, you know, that said, uh, I just want to mention, you know, from the experience with the VB DEC project, with our decoder project, uh, VBC, even in its full complexity, is, is not all that bad. You know, you, you can totally do software decoding uh, on, like, mobile devices up to, yeah. I mean, you, you know, with our software up to, like, HD. So this is a thing that we can do, but you, you can easily use the uh, full potential of VBC, and it, it's still uh, very reasonable. Yeah, you already mentioned the maximum is twice. It's only twice as complicated as HEVC, right? Um, but then the overall code efficiency, at least you mentioned that it's quite big, 30 to 50 percent, compared to uh, the potential of VPC compared to yeah. HEVC. But you and know, just, go ahead. Uh, this, this is like the savings that we can get from just encoding a, a sequence and comparing. But, you know, with the additional tools that VBC has, we can, um, we can have additional gains. So, you know, one of the things that we uh, actually worked on was to, to uh, enable, like, continuous prediction, so-called open GOP uh, in, yes. uh, in Dash streaming, right? So uh, you have your segments, your chunks, uh, and we... we developed a, a method that you can use in VBC because of the, of the uh, RPR that allows you to not have prediction breaks between the segments, you know? Uh, maybe you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yes. Thomas, you said you already suggest, uh, uh, proposed that for, for HEVC uh, using the, this part from the scalability feature. Uh, that, yeah, right. so, the, the, so the idea, um, I guess, is the same, that you have, um, you want to change resolution, maybe to optimize your quality for, for a given bit rate, and you, um, you won't may, maybe you then want to move resolution up or down, but you don't want to send a, a keyframe, an IDR frame, and restart the whole bit stream. So you need to be able to predict across res resolutions. So that's something that, you know, from the video conferencing side, I've always been interested in, and it's something that AV1 has for, for video conferencing. Um, so is, the, is it the, basically the same idea in, in VDC? Yeah, so you, you have two aspects here. One aspect is that you have that at the encoder. So, for example, video conferencing, you have an encoder that uh, adapts the resolution while encoding. Um, also, if you do, um, I guess, this, this adaptive, um, how is it called, adaptive resolution, um, uh, or dynamic resolution, whatever you call it, every uh, yeah. different vendors have different names for that. So, you, if you have content that does not have a lot of high frequencies, uh, it does not hurt to lower the resolution. You get more, it's, it's like this convex hull optimization. Sometimes you get a, a bigger bang for the buck if you uh, uh, lower the resolution and spend bits in a lower resolution if, if you don't have so much detail. So you, you can do that, but the encoder is aware of that and does that. The second thing um, that we um, will also uh, showcase at, uh, at, at IBC, uh, you, can, you can see that live, not, but you can see that in the, in the demo. 
<laughs> it's, def it's also not the live use case, but it's the adaptive streaming use case where you have several encoder separated, uh, separate from each other, creating different renditions, for example, for Dash. So one uh, low bit rate, low resolution, medium bit rate, low resolution, medium resolution, high resolution, high resolution, high bit rate. Uh, so you have different uh, renditions of rates and uh, resolutions and then the client, uh, depending on the network conditions uh, in adaptive streaming, uh, can switch to a lower or higher uh, resolution, for example, depending on the network conditions. But then you have a stream from an encoder, uh, let's say in UHD, and a stream from a separate independent encoder in HD. And then the, the client starts decoding the pictures in uh, HD, uh, has the HD uh, pictures in the decoded picture buffer, and then switches to the UHD rendition. And then the UHD pictures can refer to the HD pictures that are still in the decoded picture buffer because they are upsampled uh, using this reference picture resampling. However, if you consider encoder decoder, there's a drift because the decoder was dec uh, the encoder was encoding it using the original resolution while now the decoder uses the upsampled resolution. So the decoder uses different data than the encoder used to do its decisions. So there's a drift. And this can, depending on the coding tool, uh, can cause artifacts. Uh, so it works, but because you have that encoder-decoder drift, it can cause artifacts for a certain set of specific tools that are sensitive to that uh, resolution change. And you can constrain and there's a way in VVC to signal that. It's called, it's called constraint Russell encoding for the uh, high-level syntax aficionados. Uh, they know what the Russell is. Uh, it's a specific type of picture for that uh, at the switching point. And uh, these constraint Russell pictures, you need to constrain that small group of pictures when it switches uh, to not use these, co these tools that are problematic, and then you don't have uh, uh, artifacts anymore because uh, the, the resolution switch and upsampling, referencing uh, a different resolution than the encoder used to encode it is not a problem anymore. So this uh, gives you the advantage of making use of previous uh, pictures, so not breaking the uh, boundary at a dash segment, and uh, at the same time, uh, it also smoothens the transition. So if you have a hard cut, no uh, referencing, you can see like jumps sometimes if you switch to resolutions. You, you see that in streaming, it gets sharper or it gets blurrier, more blocky at a certain point when it switches. And by using this feature, uh, of course, you need to apply these constraints uh, at the encoder, uh, but these can be signaled so the, the, the decoder or the, the client knows that it's safe to switch resolutions uh, because the, they are constrained. Uh, then you have a very smooth transition. And on top of that, uh, Adam reminded me, uh, uh, you have another advantage when you do not switch. Exactly, because I mean, when you, when you do video streaming, how stable is your network? Usually fairly stable, right, at, at a specific level. So I think most of the time you do not switch, so you just decode the you know, open gop bit stream as it was uh, intended to be decoded. And you know, once, uh, once uh, every, every few, I don't know, like once in a... Sometimes you would, uh, your conditions would change and then you have to change the rendition and it's only at the changes where we have this special source, you know, uh, that, that causes the drift to be constrained. But usually uh, this actually works without any drift. And I think this is actually where the additional, uh, where the additional gains are coming from. So, you know, using this technique, of course, depending on your segment size, so, you know, depending on how many switches you have, uh, VVC can save you uh, additional 10, 20 percent PD rate just because, you know, you don't have to start like an independent bit stream in every segment. Right. Okay. So, in most user cases, basically because of the allowing of the switch, there's actually potential down there, right? Big potential down there. And to have the VVC enabled resolution switch without having to restart the stream. 
uh, then that saves, we all know that, if, otherwise you have to put a synchronization frame, which is the yeah. intro frame, that takes a lot but of beats and a lot of memory. Just, for, just for, for clarity, you still have to put the uh, intro frame, right? Because you want to be able to uh, start the video at, at that segment. It's only the frames that like precede the intro frame, they can use the, uh, the, last, re like, the last references from the previous. Got segment. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, but yeah. In, 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 in short, you can say uh, for technically uh, this is very simple. So the implementation of that, and because it's the encoder does not need to do that, you just run separate encoders, and then the client does it. And the client, if the client is VVC uh, compliant, it does it. So you don't need to, to implement it in additionally. So we are here by having one profile uh, solving it all. Uh, the, the, the most challenge is uh, getting uh, uh, on, uh, that open GOP is not possible with resolution switching out of the mind of the systems people. <laughs> this is the greater okay. challenge there. <laughs> because okay. It... So you're basically showing that uh, this is the already possible and this is already being implemented by the proposal of uh, the open GOP concept provided by VBC. Yeah. And and, well, you know, our, our software, it can produce, like we, we have this uh, refresh type that can produce speed streams that are compatible with that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, all the open source software out there, I think JPEG uh, is able to mux it into dash streams that just work. You know, if you have a compliant player, it just works. Yeah. So we also have an integration of our decoder in the EXO player for Android. And uh, Bitmoving has shown an, a demo of that at NAB. And uh, even in, in, in that ExoPlayer integration, you can send the bitstream switches with OpenGOP, it works uh, out of this framework. So it's not just in our controlled environment, it's also interoperable with uh, what's out in uh, at least the open source field and in, in, uh, what, what companies are using. So this, is, uh, this was actually great to see that, uh, that it is actually versatile uh, by uh, it's, it's working with uh, also other devices and software components. All right, so this is basically integrated or uh, enabled by the possibility of this standard and then integrated to the real cases and it's interoperable. Uh, so I, I do have a question before we closing this episode because I believe including Thomas down here, uh, working from standard of originally two C four ABC, even even back to the early stage. Then we have the HEVC and followed by VBC, and then I believe your team right now not only and trying to actually implement this open source encoder to manifest the largest potential of the new standard, you also may be getting involved in the new standard effort, even though that has not been officially, uh, we believe, um, like uh, official proposal calling for new standards effort. So I, I think the audience also, also want to know that what is driving not only the development of the standards, it's also your team, like have been all working on standards, codec, and encoder optimizations. It's all because there's some mission or value yeah. that you try yeah, to I, chase after. I, I guess that's that's really the, the main point uh, uh, because it has a, a really a global impact. Uh, and I guess uh, like right now we are using it. Uh, <laughs> Yes. It's, uh, I guess everyone uses it on a daily basis. Even um, you try to send text messages. Now you always include photos that are moving, like live photo you call it, or it's basically video. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. You have these, these, these reels, these short stories. Every, so video is really everywhere. Uh, and and uh, by reducing the amount of data there, uh, even if it's just like a tiny little tool somewhere in a standard, <laughs> you somehow contribute to something that is used globally on a global scale. And I guess this is, this is like one of the uh, big motivation of, of everyone uh, here. And at, at least uh, I can speak for, for our department and uh, for the development of the codex, since you mentioned our VV -Enc, uh, encoder and also the, the VV deck decoder. Uh, also the open source that put the uh, code on GitHub have patches for FFmpeg available there. Uh, that's also a big motivation because people uh, and our, our colleagues seeing 
it used uh, actually and, uh, and, and people have access to it. They make very good things out of that integrated in systems. So it's, 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 it's really good to see that, that something has a global impact. Or, is, is that also true for your <laughs> motivations? I mean, yeah, just, you know, the, the thing is, like product development, it's a very, you would know, right? It, it's like a very interesting field. There are so many things to explore. You know, each standard has its own thing. And we're a research institute, you know, and we've capitalized as a research institute very much on this development, you know, like uh, doing many publications and trying out new stuff. So, you know, in that sense, it's also just an interesting research project, in addition to, of course, being an interesting engineering project uh, and so on. So there, there is... Uh, yeah, and it's, it's also good that uh, our bosses, uh, they... Uh, they, they brought the Carbac Entropy Coder to H264. So if we have a question on, in, in that domain, we can just go next door and ask uh, Detlef Marpe or Heiko Schwarz, one of these, they, they are here next door. So it's, it's really great to have all these, these people with so much experience in the field uh, right next door. So this is, this is really a, a great opportunity also and uh, makes uh, us a lot of uh, uh, fun and it's big motivation to work here. Yeah, I think you address quite a bit of stuff down there. So not only that, first the video is everywhere, as you mentioned, and then whatever you did on a daily basis actually has a big impact. And you can also feel, I think there's a bright feeling down there. And also there's a lot of, as you mentioned, the next door, then there's a lot of collaborative efforts down there. And I think even now, they're still quite challenging. I see sometimes the quality, at least here, is not as ideal as we expected. So there's always a lot of things that we can further. So true. Uh, I think it's the most important, uh, another thing I, I, I actually learned is uh, sometimes it's a mission uh, for us or for your team to actually show the potential. Right? Sometimes the people, either uh, technicians or the audience or the and consumers, uh, they take something as grounded. And for example, text is always constant to be distributed. And video is supposed to be always, I see that whatever, it just give me the clockwise kind of progress because the video has a big amount of data. Yeah. So I was also thinking why video just uh, taken for granted has to be taking time to distribute and communicate to each other. Why not everywhere? Um, just uh, it doesn't have to be that way, even though it's volume is small, but there's always a way for other schemes that we can resolve it. Um, so I really feel very honored uh, and then this is a great time for us all sitting together talking about the videos and compressions because with the compressions, we actually uh, all focus on deliver the ideal or best possible video experiences to every single user around the world and then to in return, uh, we can feel more uh, motivated to move to the next step. And we really thank you, Ben and Adam, to come to uh, our episode. This is also the first time for me, at least, to get into the VVC. I see there's a lot of value down there. I want to say that, at least for technologies, the VVC actually put up a lot more uh, possibilities and potentials. And this is actually worth everybody to be aware of that. And thanks for Thomas. And also, I think it's a good time for you to record some of the old times doing the HMBT standard. <laughs> so we're going to close this uh, episode. And thanks for everyone. And then um, this is a great time. Actually, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, thank thanks you. A lot. Right. Thanks for having us. It was really okay. fun talk. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. -bye. So